Very good evening, uh, salam sejahtera, um, salam perpaduan uh, to all of you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Sapa Society for allowing me to share some of my thoughts on the challenges with regards to the um, uh, unregistered population uh, in the context of the healthcare uh, provision in the state. Uh, but before that, I, um, I remember uh, Dr. Chong and I were at another meeting uh, last week. And uh, we were thinking like from which angle uh, we want to say this. So I thought maybe um, for the um, unregistered population and in terms of health care, we wanted to look at the challenges by faced by the unregistered population, but also for us, the health care provider, with regards to the unregistered population. And so the outline of the, the, the um, um, sharing for this evening is with regards to um, definition. Uh, I think that's taken care of by Dr. Chong. Uh, who are they? Uh, challenges to healthcare access. This one slide. But we want to talk about why we should bother with this population. Uh, just like Dr. Heng mentioned about them being around, whether you like it or not, they are um, among us. And some points to ponder. All right. We, so who are these people in the Sabah context? Um, we will regard them as marginalized, excluded population. When um, I wrote a paper about um, making a recommendation to make vaccination immunization free to all children in Sabah, uh, I use the word unreachable uh, because uh, if we use undocumented, um, the uh, federal government seems to be a little bit sensitive to that kind of word. So we said um, unreachable, those people who we are not able to reach. Next slide, please. So who are these people? Um, there is a, um, somewhere in the internet, they call these people nowhere people, no? Nowhere people need to say they don't belong to any um, uh, yeah, nationality. Um, they are the ones who roam the street, the street children. Um, if you will remember, Dr. Chang mentioned about um, plantation workers, uh, people who come here, uh, foreign laborers, not allowed to bring their dependents, their wives and children. But we have a lot of the children of plantation workers, and these are all documented. I spent some time after my retirement going, doing outreach and I'm happy to say that in the places that I've been um, really deep in the interior, um, a lot of the children are already uh, registered and I think there is an active uh, mobile uh, office with regards to the registration of this um, group. The next slide please. But I want to talk to you about hidden population in Sabah, hidden population. Um, it's a term that they use because sometimes you see them, most time you don't, you know. Uh, I just want to go first to the picture, the photos. Um, I followed a group um, who uh, have got this problem, community feeding, you know. Ordinary days when you go to this place, you don't see anybody. But on the day that they have this community feeding, you see a lot of people, you know. Um, on days that um, this group are not there. So this is what we call hidden population. Um, actually, the term was used for these people who hide from the um, security forces, they hide from the um, um, from the um, government agencies, uh, but um, they will come up when there are problems that um, benefit them. There is no reliable estimates of this population. It is an enormous problem. Um, out of nowhere, like 35 children came up for the community feeding. The actual size um, is hidden in the very wide estimates. Nobody knows um, how many they are. Uh, and a lot of people use numbers that can be minimized or inflated, depending on which side of the point they are. So if they are um, government agencies, they say that it's not a big problem, there's not that many of them. Uh, but the, um, if you want to make it a political issue, or the people who want to make use of the numbers, you can say that a lot of them. Um, and the, the, the fact remains that it is often a contentious issue. Next slide. So challenges to healthcare, just one slide, huh? because I want to deal with why bother. Uh, so the, the first, firstly, there's no, um, these people fear the authority because they have no documents, as already mentioned by Dr. Chong. And that um, unaffordable healthcare costs, um, just an uh, illustration for immunization services. Uh, previously, prior to 2015, they paid one ringgit just like the rest of us, uh, the rest of the Malaysian. But um, in 2015, they started paying uh, 40 ringgit for registration and 40, another 40 ringgit for each vaccine. And then um, the lack, lack of financial resources for transportation, healthcare costs, loss of income, poverty, and availability of services in where they are, because they are often residing 
like behind Numbak, behind UMS, um, or in the islands where we don't provide health services there. There is language barrier, there's this uh, perceived severity, they don't come until they're really, really in a bad condition, then they'll come. Uh, and there is also that cultural belief. Um, I just want to point out that there's, where does this boy, I know this boy, Rosan, um, his name is, um, met him many times um, at, in front of RHB Bank in Sandakan. And um, he, 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 he sleeps on the street. Um, I said, I asked him once whether he has a place to go back to. He said he lives with uh, his so-called grandmother, but there are many children in the house. And oftentimes, um, when he doesn't feel like um, he wants to sleep in, he will sleep on the street. So, we don't have, so his challenge just to healthcare is enormous because basically at the age of 15, um, he has got no one to really care for him. So this is the reality of um, the people, uh, the undocumented population or unregistered population in Sabah. Next slide. So that's just one slide on challenges. I want to talk about now why bother? Why do we have to bother with this group? Next slide. Okay, um, if you want to argue it from the point of a child, child's right, and I want to put this into context of immunization services, um, we are signatory to the um, United Nations Children's Rights Convention and Article 24 says that um, we need to recognize the right of a child to the enjoyment of highest attainable standard of health and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health and that the state parties shall strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right of access to such health care services. I spoke to a group of people in UMS some, some months ago and I wanted to just paint the picture or point it out that, you know, children have got no choice um, in terms of who they want to be born in. Who they, have, they have no choice in whose parents they want to, to have. They have got no choice. And so it is the responsibility of the adults and us to make sure that children, regardless of their status, uh, grow up and have access to the basic needs. And help is a basic need. So I just want to point that out. Um, you know, many times we talk about these children. Not so sure later on, one of my slides will address some of this. But children has got no say in how, where, whom, to whom they are born. So for us, the adults, we have to make sure that um, we um, provide them the rights uh, to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of care. Next slide. Okay, why bother? Uh, I, the um, earlier, um, the earlier, what do you call it, the slideshow was on the um, uh, Sayam Over Scholar. The picture, the photo on the um, bottom left of your side, or from your view, um, is that of the dam site in Sandakan. And a lot of children, a lot of families live around there, you know, because this is their source of living. I mean, this is where they're born. I met one boy there, um, um, his name is Sunny Boy. 12 years old, and I jokingly asked him, like, how long have you been doing this kind of job, you know, that kind of thing? And he said, um, he's been doing that kind of job since the age of two. So um, I was thinking, like, what a life, you know, like a child born in this country, unregistered, and um, introduced to this kind of environment, at risk, he's at risk of all the diseases that you can think of. I remember going back there sometime in November last year, one wet November evening after a heavy downpour. And as I drove into that dump site, I rolled down the window of my car and I could smell the stench. It just shoot up the nostril and I could hardly breathe. You know? And I was thinking like, oh, what a life for any boy, you know, to be in this condition. So he has at least of many, many um, diseases, infectious, accidental, um, man-made, something that could have been avoided. And I also showed some of the pictures of their condition of the houses. I'm not so sure how many of you have been to this kind of settlement or this kind of um, villages. But for those of you who have been, I hope you don't come back and think that and, and forget about what you have seen, because this is our problem. If you don't address the sanitation in their area, not only are they exposed to those diseases that are related to poor sanitation, but they are also going to infect the rest of the population through the diseases that they come across. 
this graph of um, Sabah map is a graph is a map of the um, the number of the, pro the proportion of TB cases among non-citizens in Sabah, and uh, the darker the shade of blue, meaning to say the more concentrated the numbers of TB patients there are. So if you remember the slides given by Dr. Chong on the east coast of Sabah, there are a lot of undocumented population. And it's reflected here also in the number of proportion of um, non-citizen TB cases. So you see, um, the darkest one is um, Kinabatangan. The one that's just below it is Lahadatu, followed by Puna. There is a Purna at the tip there with Tawau. And on the east coast, you can see Kota Kinabalu and Papa. Uh, the other one is um, Belurang. I hope you know the districts in Sabah. So you notice that um, whether you like it or not, infectious disease like TB closes, which we have not been able to bring down in Sabah, is occurring a lot among the undocumented population. And one of the things that um, we talk about is whether they bring it from outside. But uh, in the paper written by this group of people, we know that these uh, foreigners, uh, these undocumented, they get TB from living within, meaning to say after they have already resided in this country, in this state for more than two years. So there is local infection going around. And don't think that infectious diseases don't cross border. Now these are people who serve you in the supermarket. These are the people who serve food in the restaurant. These are your maids. These are the people who does the construction, the extension of your houses. These are the people who will do a lot of things to keep the economy going in Sabah. So don't think that you can confine them to all these districts and ignore the problem about um, infectious disease among the undocumented. Next one. So they, they are at risk of all these diseases, and while bother, they are also at risk to others. I want to, at this stage, uh, introduce the concept of um, herd immunity. Herd immunity refers to um, providing uh, immunity to a large group of population, and, and usually we talk about it in terms of infectious diseases. You know, so um, so the blue people are the one not immunized but still healthy, and the red people are those who are not immunized but they're sick and contagious. And the yellow people are those who are immunized and healthy. So if you don't have um, immunized population, meaning to say you don't have um, the yellow people, I'm uh, talking about the first level, and you have some red people, those are the sick and contagious, they will infect the whole population. Uh, now the second layer, the middle level, is where you have a lot of people who are, some people who are immunized, the yellow people walking around, and so you will have less people who are less red people, those people who are sick and contagious. But if you have a lot of people who are immunized and they're healthy, and that's the bottom uh, level, you will notice that they provide the um, herd immunity. They, 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 they will provide the protection for the rest of the group. So you have very few people who get sick. And this is the concept of immunization. And that is why we fight a lot for immunization for all the children in Sabah. Because you cannot not put them together. You cannot say that we just immunize the local and we forget about those non-local. The concept of herd immunity is very important. So in the context of, say, for example, um, measles, you need 95% of the people to be immunized for you to protect one person. And for the other disease, it might be 87, but the numbers are high. So the concept of herd immunity is something that uh, we need to understand if we want to talk about why bother with undocumented and their, not, and their access to healthcare. All right, next slide. So still why bother? Um, we have got some concrete data. I was doing this job for, because I'm a part-time consultant with UNICEF. I did this data to find out how many people are zero dose. Zero dose means those babies who have not received the first dose of DPT for the malaise This is um, the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, DPT. Used to give. So when we look at the slide, the first thing I want to point out is that if you look at the ALB that is actual life birth, from 2013 to 2021, um, we'll find that the numbers are going down, which is ridiculous. You see people producing babies, but in terms of the actual life birth, you see from 60,000 to 40,000, you can say that this data is faulty. We are not picking it up. And why is that? It's because in 2015, remember, when people have to pay for the services, a lot of people don't come to our services anymore. So there are a lot of um, birth that were not recorded. But if we, so what I did was that, and so the number of zero doses, if we base on the number of actual life birth, you are happy. 
because if you look at the percentage of zero dose, this is the only statistic that I'm going to present, so I hope I can carry you through this one. So if you look at zero dose in 2021, only 1.1% of the population did not have did not have the first dose of DPT. Are you happy? You know, I mean, like, okay, that's good. But um, like I said, the data is faulty. If you so, what I did was that I recalculated. Can you next slide? Yes. So estimated number of live birth, I do a projection of about um, an increase. So if you look at the estimated number of live birth from sixty six thousand in two thousand and thirteen. I extrapolated it by a certain percentage to reach about 71,000. And then when you look at the percentage of zero dose, remember we were happy with 1.1, but if you really calculate it and you extrapolate it to what is the reality, you notice that 40% of the people, 40% of the children, babies born uh, have not received the first dose of DPT. And this is worrying because, um, you know, data you really need to look at it um, carefully. Next slide. So when we have a report in April of this year, what year? What did it Was it April of this year? Sabah records 986% increase in whooping cough. That's for cases, eh? whooping cough cases. Are you surprised? You shouldn't be surprised because we were looking at the data when we know that 40% of people did not have the first dose of PPT. So this is what I'm trying to say, that sometimes if you, we don't understand the situation or we don't know the background of it, we're thinking like, ah, oh, these people, these people are you know, I mean, uh, spreading the disease and things like that, but you know, the data is already there. The data are there for us to uh, decipher. We know already. So when this happened, it wasn't a surprise to some of us. Like, you know, so actually, we're looking at the data. I just want to um, bring up this picture of our first polio case in 2019. He was three months old at that time. He's going on four uh, next month, August. Um, polio first polio case, local, but he was infected by a circulating vaccine derived poliovirus 1, which is genetically linked to the Philippines. They were having an outbreak in September of that year. Um, so there is a link, there is a link with the Philippines. There's a lot of cross border movement. Because this child had only one dose of a, um, what is this now? a polio uh, vaccine, uh, hexacin at that time and he was not protected. We need three doses to protect this child. So this is a reminder to us of how we fail to look after the children in our state. You know, you think that the children who will be affected are the children of the undocumented population. This is our child, and the herd immunity that I mentioned about is to protect every child regardless of their status. All right? So he's going to turn on four. For the rest of his life, he's going to have to use that uh, trachea stomach. Okay. For the rest of his life, he's not able to walk because his right leg is affected. And I always use this slide to remind us of our failure to look after the children and of our failure to look at the sciences. Um, but just to talk about undocumented as if, you know, it's just one, uh, one problem um, about people who have got no rights to be here. Next slide. So there, there are ways to add this. White border, uh, the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being, especially so for a child. Um, quality, affordable, and accessible health care is the foundation of individuals to be productive and fulfilling lives and for countries to have strong economies. And remember, they contribute to our economy too, you know. As much as you think that they don't, uh, that they're using your resources, they're also contributing. Infectious diseases do not respect the social um, divide, nor, they, nor do they um, respect the um, uh, borders. Resources are limited. Investment in health results in gain to society beyond direct return to investors, more than just uh, monetizable benefits that are from time. So when we think about, just two more slides, uh, when we think about um, uh, resources, we think that we are um, uh, dumping our resources on them at the expense of our own people. No. And investment in health uh, has got lots more gains to the society. Next slide. And this is the last two slides, I think, some points to ponder. Uh, he was saying about people living among us, we used to say this is the elephant in the room. And a lot of people refuse to acknowledge the elephant in the room. You need to acknowledge the presence. You need to be able to talk about it. Why is it that we don't talk about it? And why is it that there is so much you know, resentment towards these people? What are our biases? And so that's why we need to address those uh, biases as well. 
uh, we need to create a safe space for discussion from this point perspective. And to this evening, I hope that I, I kind of, in a way, um, uh, put forward a different perspective, which is from the public health perspective, not from a political point of view. Take the bull by its own and look at it in the eyes. Next slide. And I just want to put this in as the last, second, third, last slide, I think. Um, Rydia Kipling, an author of children's book, he says, I keep six other seven men that taught me all I knew, their names are what and why, and when and how, and where and who. And these are the questions that we need to ask when we talk about the elephant in the room. Next slide. And so when I think about it, and we think about it, and I just want to share this last slide, second last slide. I remember when I wrote my um, thesis um, with regards to um, access to healthcare, I said you, the enabling factors, those are the ones that I remember, you need four A, four A's. As availability of services, accessibility of services, affordability of services, and acceptability of services. Having moved around in the community these past few years, I realized that you need to add another A. So if I have to rewrite this uh, thesis of mine, I'm going to add another one, which is absolute trust. There is no trust of the undocumented profession to the kind of services that we will provide because we always change them. We always keep changing our policy and we never put them into the discussion. So we need another A, which is absolute trust. Next slide. And this is the last slide. We always think that your health is an investment, not an expense. So when you spend 1,000 ringgit on the immunization of an undocumented child, it is an investment in the health of that child, and you're going to reap the benefit from all the children in the community as well. When you invest 100 ringgit for health services for the um, for the um, undocumented, it also meant that you're going to free up some of the beds to be used by for other diseases. It meant that you're going to um, not be able to control um, some of the um, um, conditions or some of the infectious diseases or some of the communicable diseases in the community by investing in health for the undocumented. So I just want to put that last point in. Stick to the science when science gets political. So when people talk about all these people not uh, having the rights to be here, stick to the sciences, they are here. And if you don't bother about them, one day they'll bother you. Thank you.